All right. Welcome everyone back to another virtual shadowing session at Hearts for Health. Today we're joined by Doris. Doris is a board certified physician assistant at the Toronto Cosmetic Surgical Institute in Toronto, Canada, downtown, um, better known as Six Surgery. She's going to be talking about the specialty, what it's like to be a PA. Uh, I know there's a lot of y'all who are very, very excited for our PA speakers, so we're happy to deliver. I do have a few reminders, especially if y'all are new. So towards the end of each of these sessions, we do have a Q&A. If you have any questions for Doris, please type them in the chat. We'll get around to them at the very end. We're going to read them out to Doris in the order that we receive them. But please do feel free to type them in the chat really any point in time. Also, if you want to stay tuned with more shadowing sessions, you probably saw the shadowing session or got to hear through our Instagram page. That's one of the ways that we publicize and announce our shadowing sessions through our flyers. Another way is our email listserv. That email listserv includes flyers too, so you're not going to be missing out on anything. It does include some extra opportunities too as well, and we do post those from time to time on Instagram. But our email listserv is a weekly listserv. You can subscribe either by emailing us at community.h, the number 4h at gmail.com. I'm going to include that address um, after this session in the video description. And also, uh, we have our website. Our website is hearts, the number 4, health.org. If you go to the bottom of any page on our website, we have a subscription request uh, form on the left-hand side. Fill it out, click submit, and you'll be good to go. Uh, again, that's a weekly listserv with our flyers, similar to what you probably have seen over our, our Instagram page for both speakers and also other opp opportunities because we do have a few other programs outside of just shadowing. Those are all the reminders I have. If you all have any questions, feel free to shoot us an email, but I don't want to take up so too much time, so Doris, feel free to take it away. Okay, thank you, Michael, and um, congratulations to you for graduating, and thank you for having me, and this is uh, seems to be a great program, and um, yeah, let's get started. So, as you know, my name, um, this is going to be a shadowing session about what I do, um, and a little bit about me, we'll start off with that. Oh, that went right to the 26th slide. <laughs> All right. Um, Okay, so just a little outline about me, my work experience, um, being a PA in Canada and the healthcare system in Canada, and we're going to get down to some fun case studies about uh, plastic surgery. And I think I just keep doing the whole slide thing. Okay, go back here. One second, let me check. Okay. So um, I'm actually a US trained PA. I was born and raised in New York. And um, I moved to Toronto during the pandemic in 2020. And I'll get a little bit more into how that came about um, in the next couple of slides. I wanted to share some fun facts about me to change it up a little bit because I've done some of the uh, shadowing sessions before. Um, so <laughs> fun fact is um, I was in the Miss Staten Island pageant. Um, and I won best sense of style and Miss Congeniality. <laughs> and I do have my motorcycle license, even though I don't have an actual motorcycle, I hope to have the courage to get on one one of these days, um, but not quite yet. <laughs> and um, I can actually do hair. I grew up in a hair salon working with my mom. And um, so, yeah, so I, I've been doing hair for quite some time on the side and I still do it for some friends and family too. All right, my work history <laughs> is quite extensive. I've been a PA now for 11 years, going on my 11th year um, this coming May. And um, when I first graduated, I started off in pediatric neurology. I worked at um, New York Methodist Hospital in Brooklyn. And that was a nice experience um, <laughs> coming out as a new grad. We had little to no uh, background training in pediatric neurology mostly just in peds, um, but it was a big learning curve for me. And we got to do like PICU, NICU, um, inpatient and outpatient. It really taught me how to properly write extensive notes. Um, I learned how to read EEGs um, for seizures and epilepsy. Um, and some of the things that we dealt with were developmental delay, genetic uh, inborn errors of metabolism, um, behavioral issues, and um, I would review IEPs, which are individualized education programs for students with 
that were delayed in school or required extra um, one-to-one -one help. Um, after that, um, I actually had took a one-year gap year, and um, I took it in Toronto. Um, I had a, a family tragedy during the time, which made the sudden move to Toronto, which my parents were already there, um, or here, I should say. And during that one year gap, um, I started looking into potentially becoming a PA in Canada. I wanted to see what it was like. Um, and I found that, you know, there was limited job offers and limited opportunity for PAs. And I'll go more into about the history of PAs in Canada. Um, so I joined the CAPA, which is the Canadian Association for PAs. And I, and I went to some of their conferences and, you know, really advocated in the actually like uh, the government system about like having funding PAs and getting PAs situated in, in Toronto, in Ontario. Um, then I went back to work. <laughs> um, I went back as a traveling PA in primary care. And um, this was quite a challenge for me to take off of a year from PA, being a PA and then going back into it. Um, I thought after one year, I'd be, you know, fine, jump back right in. But it actually was a challenge for me. I had to review quite a bit. I had to, um, you know, um, like really put the work in for being a traveling PA because uh, there's really no handholding when it comes to that. So if you're thinking about being a traveling PA and you're a new graduate, I wouldn't really advise it unless you're really quick on your feet and not about handholding and willing to see 30 patients right off the bat. <laughs> Um, so that was a challenge to, uh, so I did primary care in rural parts and, um, in Southern California with the Imperial Valley region, and then in Northern California in Humboldt County. And it served, a it served a rural area. Um, and now, um, after that, I did uh, plastic surgery in upstate New York, and I did that for three years. And then I came to cosmetic plastic surgery. So first I was doing reconstructive hand surgery and um, like skin cancers and breast cancer reconstruction. And then now I'm just doing cosmetics. Um, and I also took recently took like a part-time position in, as a sub investigator doing uh, phase one studies um, on medication, pharmaceuticals and bioequivalent medications. Um, and I'll go a little bit more into my fun <laughs> Of the place that I'm in today, I like actually interviewed with uh, with um, Dr. Jugenberg or real Dr. Six um, back in 2016, and I remember in the interview he told me that I had no, you know, plastic surgical experience, and and so I went back to the states and I applied for any single job that I could find in plastic surgery as a PA, and I got accepted and. I got my experience and I emailed his staff saying, hey, I have my experience now. And so he brought me back in, and took, took four years, but <laughs> I eventually came back to work in Toronto. So a little bit about PAs um, in Canada. So just for comparison, um, there are 1,300 PAs across Canada and 14,000 in New York State alone. Um, I don't know how many PAs there are across the U.S. total, but um, just for comparison, you can tell that it's still a small group of us that are here and um, it's still growing. And there's only four PA programs. So... Um, so when we talk about the Canadian healthcare system and how PAs are implemented into the healthcare system, we have to look at um, how PAs are introduced and you know um, the funding that goes towards the healthcare system here. Because I'm not sure if you guys know, but um, Canada has more of a socialized medicine, where the provinces in the country, which are like similar to the states, each each province has its own regulations and rules and funding. Um, pays for certain healthcare um, access. So um, 
PAs were introduced first in the province of Manitoba um, about 25 years ago, and it first actually started similar to the states um, in, in the military. Um, so we had military PAs, and then it got introduced to, to civilian PAs. Um, and Ontario did a pilot study introducing PAs into emergency, um, emergency departments back in 2011, 2012, and they graduated the first PA program back then. Um, and they only have a countrywide 96 PA program seats. So it's extremely competitive. Um, there's way more opportunity now looking at, you know, jobs, um, but it's still, it's still a work in progress. Um, and PAs in Canada, we don't have a billing number. We don't have, um, we don't, we don't have our own uh, prescription number. So everything that I do is really under my supervising physician. I get delegated what I can and can't do. It depends on the specialty. Okay, now for the fun part, um, we have a few patient presentations and uh, we'll go over what it, like going through plastic surgery and what we do preoperatively, intraoperatively, and then um, post-op, we'll talk a little bit about recovery as well. Okay, so I just have to send a warning. The following <laughs> contents have, you know, pretty graphic videos. So if you're eating your dinner at this time and this kind of stuff makes you oozy, which I'm sure I, I doubt it because you guys are all in healthcare, so. <laughs> So I have the first case, um, this patient came in for um, interested in abdominoplasty and paniculectomy. So abdominoplasty and paniculectomy are similar terms. Um, paniculectomy is a larger panis. So the panis is the, uh, the lower part of the abdomen that we typically excise. Um, so she's a 40 year old female and she really was interested in the abdominoplasty in particular because of the rectus diastasis repair. So usually when we do our abdominoplasties, we repair the rectus muscle, which can get separated um, after pregnancies and or weight, weight gain or weight loss. Um, so her past medical history, this is something that we look at um, to see how many pregnancies she actually had and um, any history that would indicate risk factors for the surgery. And because this is elective surgery, our priority is that the patient is healthy and safe before entering into something, you know, for, you know, entering into something dangerous that can potentially um, be a risk factor to their life. Um, we don't want to be, uh, put them in that predicament. So we take a full history. Um, so this patient in particular, she had a PE during one of her pregnancies. Um, and that actually increases her risk of DVTs and PEs even during the surgery. So we have to take into account how long the surgery is. Um, we usually, some people go by a Caprini score, which takes into account your, um, your age, your BMI, and will recommend uh, either like a low molecular weight heparin um, to prevent that, or maybe just like SCDs or you know, compression stockings. So it all just depends on that patient in particular, but again, history is extremely important. Um, so, and any, you know, surgery that's gonna be longer than two hours or three hours, you know, increases your risk of a P DVT. Um, so she, her surgical history, she had an open laparotomy um, after a car accident, she, I think she was, this particular patient was, you know, hit by a drunk driver and had multiple injuries at the time and they had to go in for an open laparotomy. Um, this, this is actually a pertinent uh, factor in her history because we want to know if maybe she has potential hernias um, that can, you know, be something that we look at, especially if we're planning on liposuctioning. Um, the area. Um, she's a non-smoker, she's allergy to ciprofloxacin, and she gets a rash on that and she takes it. And her current BMI is 27. So certain plastic surgical clinics um, will have a BMI cutoff, depends, especially for elective surgery. Um, if you're in an inpatient like hospital setting and it's a paniculectomy, um, 
for health reasons, then maybe the cutoff won't be, like usually our cutoff is 30 um, because we know that from studies that have shown that after 30, there is a high chance of wound dehiscence. So, and more complications with healing and infection as well. So we also want the patient to be on their, you know, a stable weight before getting the surgery because we want them to be able to maintain that lifestyle and, and um, eating habits after that. We don't also don't want them to gain a bunch of weight after their surgery because, you know, it kind of take away the, the effects of the surgery. Um, and typically we get a CBC just so we can have like, um, the baseline hemoglobin in case there is blood loss. Um, EKG depends on, again, their health, health factors and um, their age. So sometimes we'll get an ultrasound depending if like, for instance, for this patient, since she had a laparotomy, we wanna make sure that there's no hernias that we can potentially be you know, poking in and prodding in um, prior to opening her up. So. And this photo on the far right is the standard about uh, standard abdominoplasty. So you can see the incision is made on the lower portion of the lower abdomen. And we kind of cut out that whole bottom area there. Um, around the umbilicus, we usually cut around the umbilicus and then uh, pull the skin downwards towards the bottom part of the incision. And then we suture it down to there. So you can see the rectus, the rectus muscle also on the, on the picture here. And we'll go over about um, the rectus abdominis in just a bit. Um, oh yeah, so uh, when it comes to lab values in Canada, there's a slight bit of differences as far as the, what their uh, values go by here. So for instance, if you see like their hemoglobin, a normal hemoglobin in Canada is 129 to 165 for males, females 110 to 147. And, you know, in the States, when I was, when I first came here, I was like, wait, what, what is happening? So, um, so in Canada, they go by grams per liter and in the States, they go by grams per deciliter. So 129 is 12.9 to 16.5. And then a hemoglobin for females is 11 to 14.7. So this is something to consider if you, if you decide to come to Canada. <laughs> uh, the other thing that's also vastly different that I don't have here is actually glucose. Um, and that I can't do the math on that one, but I also, I just Google it, so. Okay, so this is a day of surgery. This is a patient here. Um, and so we repeat the vitals on the day of surgery. We take her height and weight once again. And actually she lost some weight before surgery um, compared to her consultation day. Um, so she, her BMI now is 25.1, which is excellent for her Caprini score because it lowers the risk of DVT. Um, and actually can have a better cosmetic result, aesthetic result, um, if she's at her ideal weight. Um, the anesthesiologist will come in and see the patient uh, preoperatively um, and just go over again the history, the drug history, and then um, she's given pre-op medications and an IV is started. Um, so in these photos, this is the lateral view of the patient. Um, I put these up here just to show you the abdomen, the extension of the ab abdominal wall. Um, so well, as we go further in the slides, we'll see the comparison of um, internal fat and external fat and uh, rectus diastasis and abdominal wall laxity. So this just shows that she's actually pretty, pretty thin. Um, she doesn't have a lot of external fat at all. Um, her stomach's protruding possibly due to internal fat, but it can also be due to um, rectus laxity and the rectus diastasis. So. So a little bit more about um, rectus diastasis and um, in this particular uh, patient, we actually did a, not just a regular abdominal plasty, but we did a fleur-de-lis incision. And this is the pattern of the fleur-de-lis because it has a horizontal and a vertical component to it. And they call it a fleur-de-lis because it looks like the fleur-de-lis of um, France, I guess, or the New Orleans Saints, or I guess the Quebec, the Quebec Quebecers also use that um, 
that logo or icon for certain things. I, I'm not sure what the relation is to France, but um, so here we are. Um, that picture shows the type of incision we made actually for this patient and you'll see the results from that. And then in the center photo it talks about the different degrees of um, rectus diastasis. So the first photo on, in the middle on the far left is um, without diastasis. So you can see that, you know, it's just the linea alba in the center there connecting the sheets and following that next to it shows you there is a separation of the rectus around the, um, um, the belly button. And then sometimes you could have just a lower, lower um, rectus diastasis and then sometimes just an upper. And the other photo just indicates kind of a, like a, I guess a sagittal view of the plication of the rectus abdominis wall. So we kind of suture it together to bring both, both edges of the rectus together. Okay, so day of, day of surgery, remove all jewelry um, because sometimes the metal and the jewelry can conduct electricity when you're using a cautery. So we have them remove everything. Um, all the consents get signed. We confirm the surgery once again with the patient. We do several timeouts to confirm we're doing surgery on the proper site, the location, are we liposuctioning? You know, all these, all these things come on the day of surgery as well. And then the surgeon does his markings or her markings and we take photos preoperatively. Um, so um, for medications, the day of surgery, we have the patient refrain from any type of blood thinners, so any type of NSAIDs prior to surgery. Um, they're given some Zofran to help with nausea. They're given um, acetaminophen to help with uh, pain. Uh, Celebrex, anti-inflammatory, prednisone, um, anti-inflammatory. And this is just, you know, I think this is just really like clinic-based um, practice. It depends, it could vary from what each, you know, hospital setting or surgeon likes to give their patient preoperatively. Um, and then in some cases we do give transexamic acid. It just all depends. Um, and the TXA inhibits plasminogen binding sites. I don't think we didn't did not give it in this case because of our history of, of PE. Okay, so before we get into the surgery, which is this is like a hyperlapse video of it. Um, can, I think I think it's playing on my end, so I'm assuming you're seeing it. Um, that's her on the table. And before we go breaking down um, the anatomy here, we want to just go over some things that surgeons love to ask medical students when they enter into the operating room is the, the layers of the, the layers of the abdomen. So um, here they are, the skin. Um, and then we go into the subcutaneous fat. This is also the, called the superficial fat. And then you have a thin layer, a very thin layer, a scarpous fascia. And um, after the thin layer is the subscarpal layer, which is the deeper fat. And then you hit the anterior rectus sheath, which is kind of where we stop when we're doing our plication of the abdominal plasty. And because underneath the rectus sheath is the muscles. Um, so, and then after the muscles is the posterior rectus sheath, and then you get into the intestines and the omentum and all that stuff, which is the danger zone in plastic surgery. We don't want to enter there. We're not, we're not general surgeons here, so. Um, so the muscles that make create the area is the rectus abdominis, which we discussed. Then you have your internal, external obliques, internal obliques, and your transverse abdominis. So I'll just wait till the end of this quick clip. He's marking the rectus and suturing those two rectus recti together. And you can see from his markings that both sides now are much closer together. We add more sutures. Because she, this patient in particular had a, such a large 
rectus diastasis, and it was pretty severe. Um, every time we kept bringing the rectus together, um, the skin that was attached to the um, anterior rectus sheath uh, also would come together. And so she had this like lump in the center there. So that's why we had to make a vertical incision to kind of get rid of that um, skin, excess skin there. You can kind of see it bulging out in the center. So that's the midline incision there, the fleur-de-lis pattern. Okay, I'm gonna go to the next slide because it goes more, it's a slower version of this. Okay, so patient is put to sleep. We review the timeout once again in the OR. Um, and we begin um, by, make, by injecting tumescent solution. And inside of the tumescent solution is um, epinephrine, which is a vasoconstrictor to help with the reduction of the blood loss. Um, we use a blunt cannula because we don't want to, you know, cut into, cut through the rectus sheath, cut through the muscle. Uh, we have to be very, very careful, especially with this patient, because we know she's had prior surgery and we don't want to, you know, get into bowel at all. Um, and so after the tumescence is injected, um, we separate out the fat and we liposuction. In this case, there was very little liposuction because once again, she's pretty thin. Um, and, and then we create the markings once again and we cut. So this is my supervising physician. Back Dr. Eugenberg. It's a good challenge you coming back. This is a lady who previously had abdominal surgery. You can see there's a big scar. Belly button's kind of bulging out. You can look at the side view. The belly is really falling out. This is not obesity. This is not in your fat. This is badly damaged abdominal muscle. She probably has a small hernia and muscle separation. Secondary to her trauma surgery. She had emergency surgery. And when, you know, when they do those, they, they really care about saving your life, not about making things look pretty. It's unfortunate as a result. She's got. <laughs> Uh, it's really big bulge, which we'll go and try to tighten and push things That's back. That's my boss. <laughs> start making incision. So we made a few lines, here. but and I'm, we're going to go with the small one. We have the patient sit up just to check our markings. And I feel confident we can go with the low marking, so we're going to go with that. So first incision, keep it nice and low. And so the cautery. Yeah, careful of lifting off the abdominal flap, skin and external fat of the abdominal wall. So scar here, this is her C-section, so we're gonna work through it. And once we get here, this can be a challenging part because the scar tissue is unpredictable. So we'll see what it looks like. I'm gonna get not there yet. I'm make my way up to the belly button and the scar area. So far, things look pretty good. Quite a bit of we'll have to sacrifice yeah, and let the that. muscles separate. So this so is when you get to the belly button. This is gonna be a very slow and careful dissection here. Up the belly button, there's a hernia in here. I think it's out of repair. We'll have to sacrifice her belly button because it's, it's wrapped in this hernia. Carefully dissect around it. So we usually cut around the, the belly button and then bring the skin on top of it downwards, and then we create a new opening on the skin surface to bring the belly button through. Um, to, while keeping it attached to its blood supply. However, in this case, because of her previous history, um, was, the blood supply the was, up. because of the scar tissue, um, we couldn't really preserve the blood supply there. And we tried to, I think, and then we had to actually remove the belly button. belly button. But don't worry, there's a happy ending to the story. We undermine all the way up to the xiphoid. The ribs come together, xiphoid is right so you there. Undermine all the way to the xiphoid, which is right in between the rib cage. The separation is not too bad, but the muscles have been probably injured and denervated, so they're stretched out. So we'll do a lot of tightening. Yeah. Tighten up the whole wall. Quite a bit. We undermine all the way up to the xiphoid. Very, very loose abdominal wall. Uh, yeah, you can just tell by the laxity automatically. And the good. So the midline, 
So he draws out where he's going right to put the sutures. That's the midline. Her separation itself is not that wide, but the, bringing this together is not going to be enough. I'll probably have to go much wider. So finishing up the first layer of muscle repair. Multiple, multiple layers. Yeah, don't worry. Go. Human tissue is elastic and stretchable with a proper support of our muscles. Which so are now you can tell once you like push it down on the abdomen. Or it actually stretch out again. It's Nothing less. like before. And hopefully it's gonna take a long time for it to get Softer, there. So. But this is not a permanent flat belly. It's gonna be flat right after surgery. But over time things will stretch out. And again, not as bad as before. But she will not have the same flatness a month from now as she does immediately after surgery. And these sutures last about six months. So after all the muscle placation, this is the, all the excess line, skin. And this line, they're coming together. These are the lines. This line. So all this skin here is excess skin, which is a lot of extra because all this extra skin was going this way. Now it's not going this way, it's flat enough so we can bring it together. And so we have a challenge here. What to do with all the skin? Ideally, we would trim it. Give her a vertical, vertical tummy tuck. Let's see if I can get away from that. She has a scar which we have to clean up anyways. So we'll see how that goes. Take a look at this. So remember she had that vertical scar was going above the belly button? That scar needs to be revised. So we'll take advantage of that and replace that scar with a new one and use it to be a little bit of a lateral pull on both sides. And She's talking about the lateral has a vertical scar. scar so we're take out some tissue to pull the skin laterally this way, not just down. Brought the skin together a little bit through the vertical scar. You can see she's got a little extra skin. So we're going to go and, and, we trim it and we trim it. These little flaps of skin. She had a previous vertical scar here. So we just exchange the scar for. I'm just going to fast forward a little bit. So before, time. and here she is now. So this is her. She has two drains Beautiful in. Beautiful new tummy, nice and flat. She is immediately does not like have a belly button. After belly button. We're going to come back when she's fully healed, typically in about belly three months, and create a brand new belly button. For now, there is no belly button, just a really nicely sculpted waist, nice flat belly. Now she's super, super flat, as I mentioned previously. I've done the best I can to flatten everything, to tighten up the abdominal wall. It will stretch out. She will have a little bulge, but nothing like before. Okay. So these are her after results. And I, and you guys remember the prior picture of the lateral views when she had that large um, uh, bulging out of her abdomen. Um, so this is her post-op. I think this is actually six weeks post-operatively. Um, so the, the scars are healing nicely, a little bit hyperpigmented, but still normal for this early stage. So here we are now. Vertical scars are really nice. Severe muscle elastic is muscle repair, so a lot of bringing. So we pull the skin down and this way, just because we brought so much muscle together, the skin bunched up. She already had a vertical scar, so we. Okay. So um, so yes, he he removed the belly button. Um, so what would be the function of the belly button in this case? Um, we actually don't need our belly button as adults. Uh, it's just something in utero that provides nutrition from the mother to the fetus. And after that, we technically don't need it. So it just kind of looks weird. So we, we, we still will, we'll still give her a belly button, but we came back later. It won't be an actual belly button, but it'll look like one. This Incision. is her again. It's nice and low. Now, if you notice, she does not have a belly button. <laughs> There's no way to salvage that belly button with all the, all the muscle repair with it. So we're gonna come back at three months. And so we did come back at three months. And so this is the marking, the center photo is the marking of the small procedure. We just did this under local, it wasn't a major surgery at all, it took 10 minutes. Um, you inject a little bit of local, like xylocaine and and then you just make an incision and you fold over the skin flaps down to the uh, rectus sheath. So it kind of gives you an um, infold there. And that was case number one. I actually work with three, oh, sorry, four plastic surgeons, um, two females and two males. 
Um, the person you saw on social media is called Real Doctor Six, aka Dr. Eugenberg, and he's my boss. So this is just me in the operating room um, with after liposuctioning and, you know, just hanging out there. And... Okay, so this is our second case. Um, we have a 49 year old female. Um, she came in because she was unhappy uh, with her body, especially after children, and she did lose some weight. So she wanted to kind of have some surgical intervention here. Um, so she got what we call a mommy makeover, which is a breast augmentation, a mastopexy, abdominoplasty, um, and that comes with the rectus diastasis repair. And she got saline implants. Uh, so saline implants, we fill with saline as it sounds. So the shell comes empty and we can fill the shell up, up to 100 cc's more than, or 150 cc's more than um, it comes in. So um, let's see here. So again, we go over a past medical history. She's had three children. Um, She's had a history of C-section. She has history of hypothyroidism and anxiety. She doesn't have a surgical, oh, surgical hazard would be the C-section and include that here. Um, she quit smoking uh, a year and a half ago and she has two drinks um, per weekend. So social history is important, especially the smoking because uh, the nicotine um, can, especially long-term smoking can create a problem with the vasculature of the blood vessels, especially the smaller blood vessels. So we have to take that into account anytime we're removing skin and we're worried about blood supply. Um, we're always worrying, worried about blood supply in plastic surgery. So, um, so fortunately for her, she quit um, and you know, anesthesia would see her and make sure her lungs sound good and she doesn't have any COPD. A medication she's currently taking is level thyroxine and um, uh, affects her and a multivitamin. Her BMI is a little bit on the higher scale, 29.4. So just again, just puts her at higher risk of BBT and complications and you know um, wound healing issues potentially, but we still we still will do a case like this. Can you turn to your right side? So he'll do his markings. Um, this is a patient before. And this is what she looks like. Um, first with the breast surgery, we infiltrate something similar to Messen solution into the breast, um, just to create a plane there. And we, we will put the implant submuscularly. Let's see what the next slide holds. Okay, so on the far right, he's doing his surgical markings. This is immediately before surgery. And we're doing both the top and the bottom. Her belly. And she says that you can see she had this full, all this extra skin. So we're gonna try to remove this, tighten this up. And we had her lie down just to simulate what happens when you take away the gravity, right? So when she stands, everything is falling out. Her belly is really bulging. When she lies down, everything falls in. So this is this gives you an idea of how much uh, volume there is. This is about as 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 narrow as flat as we can create her for her. This is her ribs sticking out here. So these are ribs sticking out, and we'll lose the muscle tightening to try to keep her as. So we do put the implants under the um, muscle and we put it under the um, pectoralis major. So this is the breast fold. I want to make my way down. So this is a video of the muscle. breast implants so going in. So we create a incision in the IMF, which is the inframammary fold. These are the saline implants that he's taking out now. We insert them in the data dime. It's a big shell. Roll it, up. it is pretty a bigger size, uh, 650 um, cc. Uh, however, she's broader in her chest wall. We base it off of the chest wall length. So we'll see the results. The thing about saline implants, they go into a small okay. opening and then they get a play once they go inside. And then you can fill them with uh, saline implants. So this is us filling them with the okay, So we have, uh, we just now have a new area line. 
So once they're, once we put the implants in, then we can make our markings for the actual lift um, because um, the implants are supported by the muscle now. And so they're gonna be sitting much higher than the actual breast tissue, which have, which usually fall over time with gravity. Um, so we'll bring the breast tissue up along with the areola so that it stays in line with the um, actual implant. Well, less small lift, it's less of a lift than I thought. Good for her, less of a stair, so we'll go over this with a vertical lift, not only for the anchors I was initially planning. So we'll, we'll go over the different types of lifts so that we do. Cutting around the area a lot. Free it up. Give the excess skin. A lot of plastic surgery is excision of excess skin. <laughs> And that's the that's the end result of the breast on the far left. And then we went into the abdomen, and here he's just injecting to mesence. And we kind of went over what the abdominal plasty would look like, so I'm not going to go over the full video. But I just wanted to show you him injecting um, to mesence because we did do a lot of liposuction on this particular patient, unlike the other previous case that I discussed. So, we're going to stop and move on to the so this part. is the liposuction part. Make sure you got a good amount of fat. Um, it should, oh, no. I thought that we had more video of him doing liposuction. We should probably do more liposuction, but it's still bloody, so we're going to stop and move on to the top of the So, similar like the other case, incision and made. Lobules. And here he's just demonstrating, um, well, this is the belly button now, so we've but he's going to demonstrate the external and internal fat and scarpous fascia here. There's your old belly button. Look at the thickness of her external fat. Look at the size of her fatty lobules. That was not liposuctioned. So in this particular case, I really can't see the separation between the superficial and uh, the Fat. Fat. They usually separation is not as scarp as fashion. And I really, really can't see it. I think it could be, I, I'm, I'm just guessing, it could be down there. So, really, to a very little deep external fat and a lot of superficial external fat. And the separation is right there. It was very difficult to elevate. And you can see here, I, I don't see, um, maybe, maybe I see scarpous fascia there. I'm, I'm really just guessing, but it's not obvious. So you can see sometimes people are 50, 50, sometimes 60, 40, short tummy tuck. Okay, so the That's a big, big head. That was the excess amount of skin we were on this That's patient. Cool. Her results big, are pretty big incredible. Of fat, big of fat and a lot of extra skin. Okay, so here we are. Um, so this is a before and after the same patient, um, breast lift, breast implants. And you can see on the, the post-op picture, the implants are still sitting up high. It's still early in the recovery. They will fall and drop a little bit. Um, but she had a pretty, really good result and outcome. Um, This is the lateral view again because we tightened up the muscle. We did a lot of liposuction, so we did 5,000 cc's of liposuction, which is five liters. Um, so yeah, just compare that to Coke bottles, I guess. Um, the panis that was excised was 1.8 uh, kilograms or 1847 grams. So she did have two drains because we usually put drains, uh, well, one, we put sutures in to kill off some of the dead space there because once we undermine the flap, we have to, um, we want the upper part of the skin to come back down to the rectus sheath. Um, otherwise the space in between, between will just collect fluid and we call that a seroma. And then eventually what can happen with the seroma is it can become infected and that would be, then we'd have to open up and, you know, incision and drainage pretty much there. So we use drains, we use sutures to prevent the seroma from happening and an infection from happening. Um, and typically we will remove the drain 
um, when the output is less than 25 cc's, like two days consecutively. Okay, so going back to the blood supply, um, a lot of emphasis on the blood supply, both to the areola and to the abdomen, which is the next slide. Um, so for this patient, we did a vertical incision. Sometimes we'll do an anchor incision, which is shown on the uh, picture over here, the different types of um, incisions that people, that surgeons can make for when you're doing a breast lift, breast reduction, or um, uh, mastopexy. So the first one is an anchor type of lift, and we did a vertical, which is shown here as, as G. And um, so the blood supply comes from the um, internal thoracic artery via the anterior perforators, and internal thoracic is also known as a mammary artery. And then you have the lateral thoracic artery, and it comes from the intercostal. And these go through the perforators from the intercostal arteries. So that's important to know um, because we want the blood supply of the areola to, to suffice. We don't want a dead areola, and then we have to do wound debridement and, you know, uh, a patient to lose their areola. This is just a surgery from, from above and hyperlapse mode. And you can see she really had a really drastic uh, result. This is them cutting off the panis. Sorry, guys. <laughs> just through the hole. Uh, Our belly. Sorry, guys. I just kind of jumped ahead here. Here we go. Okay, um, and then also the abdomen. So when we remove the lower portion of the, of the abdomen, the panis, um, we again, we have to worry about blood supply, um, especially after all that liposuction. Um, so, and especially when we, you know, cauterize blood vessels and we're lifting up the flap off the rectus sheath, we wanna make sure that um, the blood supply is intact because this can cause a wound dehiscence and infection and um, dead tissue essentially that needs to be debrided. So um, when it comes to the abdomen, um, we have the deep epigastric inferior and superficial branch of the iliac, um, the deep circumflex iliac artery uh, that branches off into the external iliacs. And then you have the superficial inferior epigastric artery then that supplies the skin of the lower abdomen. And then they talk about zones. If you wanna get into the zone one, zone two, zone three, um, based off of the um, arterial location. And um, those are, that's the conclusion of my cases. I think they're pretty interesting. I think they had pretty good results. Um, and it's kind of fun stuff that I get to help in the process and transformation of these patients. Um, it's really cool. And it's actually like their experiences um, affect them to another level. I mean, even, even on like a, maybe not such a drastic change, even people like patients coming in for smaller things, um, that may not seem so drastic to someone else, but for them, it, it does make a huge difference in their lives. And um, I know there's a lot of like taboo around cosmetic plastic surgery and things like that. But I think when you're in it and you see it from this side of you, or if you've had it done before to yourself, then I think you kind of understand um, what it's about. And I hope you guys didn't think I was going to talk about Botox and fillers <laughs> tonight. <laughs> okay, I wanted to do a little something for Black History Month um, because, and it has to be a female. <laughs> so the first, uh, this is the first African American female surgeon, uh, Myra Dell Logan, and she was a cardiac surgeon and pediatric, specialized in pediatrics. So I think that's really cool. And uh, she was the first woman to perform open heart surgery. African American to perform open heart surgery. So I like stories like that that are inspiring because we all have our challenges and it's important to keep going and you know not listen to what other people say or think about you or think what you're capable of. Um, sometimes you do have to prove yourself and even when no one else believes in you. Um, another person, um, Dr. Selby, um, he has a Health in Harlem podcast 
and um, he's a good friend of mine. And I did the episode on BBL, Brazilian butt lifts with him, uh, dangers of Brazilian butt lifts. So you can support him in honor of Black History Month, or if you're just interested. Um, and I'll be open to some questions. Um, we have a YouTube channel with my um, plastic surgeon, Dr. Six, and I also work with Dr. Rose and Dr. Constantine. So there's more fun cases that you can watch live um, on Snapchat, on Instagram, on YouTube, on, <laughs> on um, TikTok, all the mainstreams of <laughs> social media. This is my Instagram page. Um, that's the uh, Snapchat thing there. And if you are in Toronto area, <laughs> I'd like to come shadow me. Um, feel free. Um, I also am a co-facilitator at University of Toronto PA program. Um, this is a class of last year teaching them how to don and doff um, gowns um, because I was a student once upon a time in these other little photos. <laughs> and uh, so it's nice to uh, learn and teach and continue the profession and help others out. And um, this is actually the lo location of of where our clinic is. It's at the Fairmont Royal York in downtown uh, Toronto, home of the Raptors and Maple Leafs. And that's it, no football teams, but <laughs> I don't think that's gonna happen anytime soon. So yeah, you can message me. I can also send out my email too, if you guys are interested. And this is my go-to for people who are interested in plastic surgery or doing a plastic surgical rotation or maybe getting a new job in plastic surgery and want to learn about it. This is like, has been a lifesaver for me and it's super fascinating. And I still go to it even, even um, to do these slides, I still refer to it sometimes. So I think that's it for my slideshow. I don't know if I'm making good timing or <laughs> yeah, if I first to do that, but yeah, I'm open to any questions you guys may have. Yeah, we have quite a few rolling through. Um, I just want to, first of all, thank you, Doris, for getting this together. Um, I mentioned this before we got started, but wonderful graphics. And the doctor himself was going through these surgeries. That's that's a unique thing. I think we've had one session where we've been kind of taken through. It was live. We've been taken yeah. through. And seeing those videos is very, very helpful. It's really cool to see it, too. Um, the OR is sometimes a space that students can't really get much access to or, or would love to get access to and, and just take a look. So that's really greatly appreciated. Um, we have a lot of comments, a lot of questions. So just to start it off, our first question is, could you talk about your schedule? Uh, what's, what's it like to have a day in the surgery or the clinic? Um, I feel like this is going to lead into work-life balance. Um, <laughs> uh, okay, so surgical days are often long, unpredictable. Um, it's kind of go with the flow type of thing, but I typically start my day at seven o'clock in the operating room. Um, but obviously the, I get dressed and get there. So I wake up at like five 30 just to get there on time. And, um, we start the first case at seven 30. I go over the cases for the day, like looking at their charts. Um, my primary like role in this particular clinic is to like assist in the operating room. So, um, you know, some surgeries are like three hours, some are four hours. The shortest one is like an hour. Um, and we typically, you know, go until we're pretty much done for the day. Um, sometimes that's later, sometimes that's earlier. It just really depends if we're running on time, if there's, you know, sometimes the patients, sometimes the patients, there's issues with the patients, we have to cancel them if, you know, especially now during this season, we're getting a lot of cancellations due to like upper respiratory infections, viral illnesses. So sometimes we get like half a day and we're like, yes, let's get out of here. But um, I usually work four days a week um, in the operating room. And, you know, lunch breaks are, <laughs> are pretty quick, um, but it's a fun environment. It's like, go, go, go. And we try to be efficient. Uh, we try to reduce the amount of medical waste that in this particular clinic, um, it's something that we care about. Um, and yeah. And then the other day that I'm not here, I am in the, um, in the testing center, um, reviewing and pre-screening patients. So 
Um, yeah, it's a lot of fun. Sometimes I will do assist with follow-ups and stuff like that in, in this clinic, but uh, mostly needed in the operating room for suturing and. Yeah, and definitely a variety of schedule there, which is cool. Yeah, yeah. Our next question is about why you decided to become a PA. Did you ever consider any other health profession like med school, nurse practicing, any other side to healthcare besides PA? So yeah, um, I didn't really talk about it um, in my slides, but yeah, I became a PA. Um, I actually made the decision in high school and my program was five years right after high school. So I finished, I graduated pretty early on in, in my early twenties and I became a PA because uh, I actually had a dermatology PA that was like so awesome and would take care of my really bad skin and acne. I know you can't tell now, but I had really bad acne um, as a teenager and even into my early twenties. Um, so she basically spent so much time with me and really walked me through the process and, you know, just talked to me. And it was really nice to have someone like that who was my healthcare provider. Um, I felt like the physician was very busy, you know, in and out of the room, you know, hardly made an interaction with me. And I was like, oh, this is cool. Like, I kind of want to look into this career. And, and so um, I decided on the PA program. I looked into programs and I applied for it as a senior in high school after my SATs. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I did consider other, I, I did consider like MD, um, but at the time, you know, just yeah, the schooling seemed so long and I didn't want to deal with residency. You know, when you're a teenager, you're just like, I want to get out. I want to make money, that type of uh, mentality. Um, I don't know if I, I would reconsider that at this stage in, in the game. Um, I think it's a possibility, um, but it's never too late to go back to school. I do feel like I have a great knowledge base and experience and maybe even further interventions like hospital policies and things that we're, where we can make a change after learning about um, you know, some of the downfalls of the healthcare system to try to improve that. But yeah, I would consider other, even now, I mean, I, I don't think it's too late. I would consider other, um, other schooling or more schooling. You touched on this uh, next question here a bit, um, but how hard was it to get into cosmetics slash plastics with no prior experience? It sounds like being at the sixth surgery, it's a little more competitive to get a job just with the amount of experience that was required. I'm not sure if that was the particular reason why you had to go back to the U.S. and get more experience. Um, but what are your thoughts on that, getting into plastics with no prior experience as a PA? Um, yeah, it was, it was tough. I think right now it's a little bit easier just because more plastic surgeons are looking for PAs and willing to train. And sometimes the training could be based on the techniques of that particular plastic surgeon and likes things done a certain way. Um, so they're a little bit, new grads are a little bit more moldable, but um, in this particular practice, I'm actually really glad that I came in with experience because it's a quite a demanding job. Um, and it's just better <laughs> to have experience, honestly. Otherwise you kind of feel like you're thrown in um, with this level of demand. Um, so yeah, I went to the States, but the other, you know, the other hospital that I worked at at Bassett hospital in upstate New York, um, it was good. It provided me with a lot of foundation in plastics and it wasn't just cosmetics. I think, you know, seeing the reconstructive part of it, um, really, really just gives you a wider base knowledge. So, and people who are trying to get into plastics and I always wanted to do plastics, even when I graduated, um, um, but obviously I did other things and I actually appreciate all those other experiences and other specialties because it just made me a well-rounded PA, um, well-rounded in medicine um, to be in one niche and knowing medicine of like one type of specialty um, is limiting and can be kind of boring. So, but it's nice to incorporate, you know, and get the whole picture of medicine. So those people who are anxious to get into jump into cosmetics, thinking it's like Botox and filler is like, it could be a good thing, or you wanted to start your own medical spa, like that's awesome. Like you should pursue it, but don't get discouraged if you know you have to do primary care for a few years just to get your feet wet. So come shadow me too. That's good experience. <laughs> yeah, if you are in the area, definitely shadow her. Also, and, and I think we'll go through three more questions just to wrap it up for the sake of time. 
Our next one is, did you have to go through any fellowship or further trainings at any point in time, or was it mainly experience that got you to the next level after PA school? Yeah, so there are some clerkships. Um, I know the Cleveland Clinic has a plastic surgical clerkship. Um, they only take new graduates because you get paid at a stipend. Um, um, so no, me in particular, no, I didn't have extra training or clerkships that I went through. I just applied for, you know, plastic surgical jobs across the country. Like I didn't, I didn't limit myself to the state that I would live in or the place that I would live in, or if it was like, you know, some city or like a particular place that I wanted to be in. So I kind of like had an open mind about location. And I think that can be a stopping factor for some people. Um, but, you know, not everybody can do that based on their family. And, stuff, so. and I think you already touched a little on this, but outside of just becoming a PA, what interested you specifically in the specialty in plastic surgery? Um, well, I was interested in plastics because... <laughs> I thought it was cool. No, no I, I thought it was um, pretty cool. I actually wanted to open up a medical spa. <laughs> so I graduated PA school and I was like, I want to open up a medical spa before I'm 30 and I want to, you know, have it in the city and I want to, you know, make lots of money. And um, I still want to do that. <laughs> no, I still want to do something similar to that. But um, I was just always interested in plastic because I had the like esthetician, uh, you know, beauty and hairdressing background. And then my skin and the whole experience with that, um, I thought that it was like instant gratification to see that transformation right away. I didn't have to wait, you know, a year or something to help someone. I felt like it was just instant. It's something that I can actually physically do. Mentioned going from the States to Canada. So how is that transition? You mentioned a few things, like, for example, the measurements with uh, medications. That's one thing that um, really caught you off guard. And I'm sure that definitely makes a big difference. Um, outside of that, are there any other obstacles um, that you felt along the transition? Or was it more of a smooth transition in general? Yeah, as a PA, I mean, um, the salary base, you know, starting salary base is a little lower. And that applies for physicians as well because of how the funding is. Um, a private practice, you know, out of pocket is not, not as bad. Um, and then like medications, um, the healthcare system varies quite, uh, quite a bit. Um, there's not as many, there's cheaper medications here, which you have to pay for. You have some, some, uh, Americans don't realize that Canadians still have to pay for their medication prescriptions. They have to pay for, um, if they require like dent dental work they have to pay for that out of pocket it's not covered by insurances um, but for prescriptions in that regards it's much cheaper here to purchase it but it's generic brands and it kind of um kind of like limits like name brand newer medications to come to canada or to be approved in canada because they don't sell as much um, pharmaceuticals here which can be limiting to certain for certain um uh, you know diseases and stuff like that you mentioned earlier that there was just 1,300 uh, PAs in all of Canada compared to the 14,000 in New York. At this point in time, how would you, um, what are your thoughts on the job demand for PAs uh, at the moment in Canada specifically? This is from someone who said that they're interested in going to the U.S. for PA school, um, but would like to come back to Canada um, and just would like to he hear your thoughts about if um, job outlook. Is, is on the rise in Canada in terms of being a PA? Yeah, so it's much better than what it was five years ago, and it's only going to get better and better each year. Um, they passed regulation approval in the province of Ontario, which will open so many more doors and opportunities for PAs. Um, they're also starting a new, they're having more seats in a, another PA program in Canada, so it'll be great. And I think that's a good idea to have the ability to go to school in um in the u.s because your certification will apply to canada certification whereas if you're if you went to accredited school in canada it may not as a pa you may not be able to work in, in the states without 
repeating PE school, unfortunately. So there's no reciprocity there. Um, but yeah, I think the the outlook is really promising. Um, people know that there's a need. There's a shortages of healthcare workers in general. So having you know, there's a lot of studies that are have been done to show the efficiency and the usage of PAs implemented in all types of specialties, um, especially in emergency departments, especially in family practices. So um, it's only just going to get better and better. And you know, I also, you know, we also have to do our parts as PAs and continue to, you know, show our worth and our value and also like advocate for the profession here. So um, the Canadian Association of PAs has an annual conference that I, I plan on attending. And, you know, I also will be presenting there as well. Um, and I think this year it's in New Brunswick in Canada. So you guys want to come? Yeah, well, that's all for questions. I really do appreciate you taking the time to answer these questions. And like I said earlier, um, to get this presentation together. Um, there's a lot of pre PA students just from the questions we've had that are very interested and plastic surgery is uh, one of those uh, specialties of even further interest, I'm sure. Just a few reminders before we wrap up, especially to the students listening in, for those who are seeking to earn credit for your attendance, we have a quiz. That quiz is posted in the chat box. It's also on our website. So uh, feel free to click on that quiz in the chat box, or if you prefer, go to our website um, under the virtual shadowing page. We have a Monday and Thursday quiz. Click that Thursday quiz, and you'll be guided to the Google form. It has 10 questions on there, six out of 10 or more, correct? And you'll um, pass. It will be due next week, Thursday, or sorry, Wednesday. It'll be due on Wednesday. February 15th at 11.59 p.m. Central Standard Time. Typically, it's due six days after each session. So that's the reason why um, we have the deadline set to then. Like I said, if you do pass that quiz, though, you'll receive a certificate. So that's the way that you can document hours. Um, and that will be sent to the inbox, the email address that you list on the quiz. We recommend a personal Gmail or Yahoo uh, address. If you don't receive that certificate, please check your spam folder. If it's not there, feel free to send us an email. Um, but in terms of our future shadowing sessions, we're not going to have a shadowing session on Monday. Unfortunately, our speaker was not able to make it for Monday, but we will have a session next Thursday on the 16th of February, same time, 7 p.m. Central. It's going to be with Dr. Asif. He's a transplant hepatologist at Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. Uh, so very excited to see him soon. And um, like I said at the very beginning, if y'all wanna follow us for more, we have our Instagram page. We also have our listserv. Both are great ways to stay tuned with us. Doris also has her Instagram here on the slide and um, her clinic's Instagram, it's at six surgery. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay, perfect. Right. We'll definitely Make give me her proud on the quiz guys. <laughs> Do well. Yeah. Do not yeah. need a belly button. <laughs> yeah, I mean the quiz in general, for, for y'all tuning in, it, it's really just something to track attendance. We keep it at um, a six out of 10 if needed. So if y'all have any questions to do with that, feel free to send us send us an email, but feel free to give Doris a follow, give, give her clinic a follow, check out the YouTube channel, check out the Snapchat, check out the Instagram page. Um, so, sh so show some love and support. And if you are in the Toronto area, definitely take advantage of the opportunity that um, they have for some shadowing. I'm sure it's going to be a great experience just from hearing from one of your physicians. Um, very, very detailed with, with how he goes about things. He knows what he's he's talking about for sure. He, he knows exactly what's going on. And it's really interesting to see it. It's It seems like a bit of, you know, not necessarily a mess, but kind of just a work in progress with surgery. But he definitely knows how to execute for sure, which is great to see. It, it's really a wonder to see with surgeons. Um, but like I said, thank you so much, Dor Doris, for, for yeah. joining us. We really do appreciate it. Let's hear some thank yous in the chat uh, for Doris. Um, and that really wraps it up. So we will see all of you next week. We hope you guys